TheYeshiva.net. The Jewish people have traveled the wilderness for 40 years, close to 40 years. They are now poised to enter into the promised land, the Holy Land, Eretz Canaan, the land of Canaan, which would become Eretz Yisrael, the land of the Jewish people. They are now in a place called Arvois Mayav, the plains of Mayav. Today's geography it would be southern, south of Jordan, in the po- at the point where it touches the, the, the Dead Sea, the point of south, southern Jordan, where it touches the Yam HaMelech, the Salt Sea, the Dead Sea. And the nation of Mayav, the king of Mayav, Balak, the nation and the king are petrified. They're overwhelmed by fear and dread of the Jewish people who are close to the borders of their country. They discuss it with a neighbor, Midian, and they decide to hire, Bullock decides to hire the seer of the time, the Gentile seer of the time, prophet by the name of Bilam, in order to curse the Jewish people. It's interesting that in 1967, they discovered in Jordan, in today's Jordan, uh, an inscription of plaster where it says that uh, the the divine prophet, the divine seer, Bilam ben Ba'ir, his name. If I'm not mistaking, it's, as far, if I'm not mistaking, the earliest archaeological discovery outside of the Tanakh of a name in Chumash of such an early date. What happens at that point is Bilam receives the emissaries, the agents, and he says he has to consult God. And at night, in the dream, he consults God, and God says, you should not go. So he refuses, he tells them that he can't come. So Balak, the king of Moyev, assumes that the emissaries were not distinguished enough, and he sends a second set of emissaries, far more prominent and distinguished, promising Bilam, the world, if he would just come to curse the people of Israel. And Bilam says, I already told you, uh, I, cannot fi- I cannot violate the will of God, even if Bala gives me a house filled with silver and gold, stay over the night, I'll ask God again. And as Rashi explains, that Bilam was a type of prophet who could only experience some divine messages at night, during his sleep, during his dreams. And when Bilam asks a second time, this time God tells him to go. He should go. So he goes. And when he's going, he's riding on the donkey. Now the story shifts from Balak and Bilam, and the focus of the story now becomes the donkey. Even though the donkey is mentioned quite a few times in Tanakh as the one who people or items use to ride on, but here suddenly the story shifts to the donkey itself. And the Torah continues the story that God sees that Bilam went and he's upset. Hashem is upset that he went. So what happens? He stages an angel, a malach of Hashem, an angel of God, to obstruct the voyage, the journey of the donkey. And this happens in three acts. Act number one, the donkey is riding and the angel is standing right in front of him with a sword in his hand and the donkey who experiences the visage, the image, the energy of the angel of course moves to the side of the road, goes off the beaten track in order to protect itself and Bilam, who is unaware of what is happening, beats the donkey, hits the donkey, strikes the donkey to get it back on track to continue its journey. Scene number two is the donkey is now on a pathway between two vineyards and once again the angel is in front of the donkey so the donkey squeezes itself to one of the sides, to one of the fences, the walls protecting the vineyard, and Bilam's foot is now squeezed toward to the fence by the donkey who's fearful of the angel in front of him, and Bilam again beats the donkey to go back in the path and continue its journey. And then a third act where uh, once again the donkey is now in a narrow path and there's no place to go right or left, there's literally no place, 
and the angel is there, and the donkey has nothing to do, and it just crouches and refuses to move on. Bilam is beating the donkey because he's frustrated. And at that time, at that moment, something unexpectedly happens. Hashem God opens the mouth of the donkey. And to read to you, to read you, sometimes you have to read the text in order to appreciate the impact. Hashem is Piyas and Hashem, God opens up the mouth of the donkey. And she says to Vilam, one, two, three, four, five, six, eight words. What language did she speak in? What have I done to you that you beat me three times? Because each time the story repeats itself in a different fashion, he's beating her. What did, what did I do to you? And Bilam actually responds, what would you do if your donkey started to speak to you? You would call Hatzalah, Mesaskim, Mesherim, Mesamrim, 911. You would run frantically. You would holler. The whole block would wake up. And Bilam says, okay, I'll tell you why. Because <laughs> you abused me. His <laughs> be you mocked me. You, you traumatized me. You made fun of me. You manipulated me. His be means you, uh, you put me to shame. Rashi says, you disgraced me. You put me to shame. If I would have had a sword, I would have I killed you. And the donkey, they continue the conversation. The donkey says, what do you mean? I've been your donkey upon which you have been riding throughout your entire life. Have I ever behaved this way with you? And Bilam says, no. The next scene is, Vayigal Hashem es Bilam. God opens the eyes of Bilam and he sees the angel standing on the road with a sword. And now Bilam bows his head and he prostrates himself to the angel and the angel asks one question why did you beat your donkey three times i am the one who caused this donkey to obstruct your path the donkey has seen me initially and thus moved away from the path or crouched three times and bilam tells the angel i have sinned i did not see you I did not know that you are obstructing my path. If you want, I'll go back. And the angel says, no, 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 you go, but you will speak the words that I put into your mouth. And Bilam at last follows the princes, the ministers of Balak, and the story continues how he arrives. Balak tells him the story, wants him to curse the Jewish people. At the end, he is speaking the words that God puts into his mouth. And he utters and he communicates some of the most beautiful prose in the entire Tanakh, in the praise and blessing of the Jewish people, some of the most cherished verses that Jews repeat every morning, like Matoivu, Ayalecha Yaakov, Mishkanesech Yisrael, prophecies about Mashiach are all sourced in the words of Bilam the prophet. As in every story of the Chumash, there is an enormous amount to discuss. Various facets, dimensions of the narrative ought to be explored, dissected, analyzed, and finally applied to life, which is always the ultimate purpose of Torah, Torah Shayim, a Torah of life, meaning one that engages, informs, enlightens, and inspires one's life. But I want to focus today on at least two, two details. One is what seems as, what seems ostensibly so strange, and that is God's apparent change of mind. Not once, not twice, not three times, but four times. When the agents, when the emissaries come from Bullock to Bilam the first time, Bullock is frightened. He sends a message to Midian, the elders of Midian, we are going to be, we are going to be destroyed. They come to Bilam and they offer him the offer, they invite him to come and curse the Jewish people. He says, I have to ask God. At night, when Hashem asks Bilam, who are these people? 
Bilam tells them the story. They want me to curse the Jewish people. And Hashem said, Don't go. Don't curse them. They're blessed. Okay, God said what he wanted. Don't go. And Bilam, as a loyal person, gets up in the morning and says, God doesn't let me go. They come back to Balak. Balak tries again. They come back to Bilam a second time. And what does Bilam say? Balak could give me as much money as he wants. I cannot violate the word of God. But stay here another night. The second night, Bilam communicates with God again, and God has a change of heart. If they came to get you, go with them. But speak what I will tell you to speak. The first night you told them not to go. The second night you told them to go. Okay, for whatever reason, the second night Hashem said, I want you to go. Granted. Now what happens? He goes. <laughs> and the next scene is, Hashem is angry. This is a very strange setup. You tell me not to go, I say I'm not going to go. Then you tell me to, I send them away. Because you told me not to go. They come back, you tell me to go, so I go. Now you're getting angry that I go. So now you're angry at me for listening to you the second time. And what happens? An angel obstructs the path of the donkey. So we have the whole story of the donkey. So when the angel finally appears to Bilam, and Bilam says, okay, I got it. You don't want me to go, I'll go back. He says, no, 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 I want you to go. So he goes. What's going on here? This is beyond mysterious. This is beyond strange. It's no, yes, no, yes, thank you. Thank you for the clear directions and guidance, and now you're getting upset at me. Now we know that there are people who do behave like this constantly. There's even a word for it in English. It's called indecisive. And sometimes indecisive in a uniquely exaggerated and dramatic way. Right? Some people, when it comes to buying a dress, it's not four times. It's sometimes 40, 50, 60 times. Yes, no, no, yes, 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 no. And you, know, and you just end up returning it to the joy of your husband. <laughs> Due to the bill, not your husband, somebody's husband. There are people who simply can't make decisions. They just, any decision they make almost traumatizes them. It could be a decision about a color of a rug or a carpet. It could be a decision what should be the dessert by the Sheva Brachas, the Bar Mitzvah or the wedding. They sometimes have sleepless nights over such decisions. Never mind if it's a bigger decision. So we know, we know we, we, we're very familiar with this trait or challenge that some of us have and the people around us who have to deal with indecision. But here we're talking about the, the creator of the world who's doing this. No, yes, no, I'm angry, I'm going to stop you. Oh, should I go back? No, go. The Mepharshim struggle with this. They struggle with this. Many Mepharshim have addressed this. First is the Ramban, the Akeda, Ksava HaKabola, the Malbim, the Basayin, on many different levels, many different interpretations. The Malbim and the Ksava HaKabola give the famous interpretation based on a grammatical insight into the Hebrew language. The first time Hashem tells Bilam not to go, he says, Hashem tells Bilam, don't go with them. Don't go with them. Don't curse the nation because he's blessed. The second time when Hashem tells him to go, he says, Kum, get up, leich itom, go with them. In Hebrew, there are two different expressions for with them. Imohem and itam, right? What's the difference between going imam with them or itam with them? The English translation is identical, go with them. But the first time he says, don't go imahem, second time he says, leich itam. So the Malbim and the Ksav HaKabbalah, two of the great commentators on Chumash, more contemporary ones, relative to the Rishonim, both 
give the following explanation, and that is that Etam, when you go with somebody, when you walk with somebody, when you go with somebody on a journey, there's two ways of joining them. One is geographically, and the other one is mentally. Meaning, when you're sitting with somebody on an airplane, somebody you never met before, it could be a 21-hour flight or a 16-hour flight or 11-hour flight. You're he heading to the same destination, but mentally you're not in the same place. Yeah? You're going for one purpose, the other person is going for a completely different purpose, and indeed, when you part ways, you sometimes part ways, you'll never see them again as close as you were for the 11 hours of flying together, and you spoke, and you know everybody thing about her family, and she knows everything about your family, and she knows everything about your eating and sleeping habits, and you know everything about her eating and sleeping habits, etc., etc. Sometimes you know, get to know them better than you know your own brother, because when was the last time as an adult you spent 11 hours sitting together right near your sibling? But nonetheless, when you say goodbye, have a safe journey, enjoy your stay, it's bye-bye and sometimes bye-bye till next time, which may, may be uh, a few thousand years. So you're going together, but mentally you're in a different place. We could sometimes go with somebody to a particular place. Physically we're together, but not mentally. And the Malbu says that's the difference between going with somebody. There's imam and itam, or imay and itay. Hashem says, loy selech imahem. Don't go im with the person. Im with the person means you're joining forces as one, not just physically, but also mentally. You're going for the same purpose, you're going for the same intention. Ita means you're also going with them, but you remain distinct in terms of your strategy, in terms of your purpose, in terms of your plan. I don't want you to go with them for their purpose of cursing the Jewish people. I want you to go with them, but your purpose is going to be completely different. This is just one example, one interpretation of the Mepharshim. There are other interpretations. The difficulty with this interpretation is that when the Malach finally tells Bilam to go the fourth time, he says, Leich imha anashim. So that is the big problem with this interpretation. But there's another pshat, another interpretation, maybe a little bit on a different level. And that is a simple interpretation and also a very profound one. And that is... What do you think is the hardest word to hear in the English language or in any language? What is the most difficult word to hear? No. The word no is a very difficult word to hear. And no exists on many stages, on many levels, in many ages, and considering, considering different realities. Sometimes no means... You can't eat the tenth lollipop. No. Sometimes no means you can't stay up till four in the morning. No. Sometimes no means you can't destroy the kitchen, the dining room, and the living room. Sometimes no means you can't beat your sister to a pulp. Sometimes no means you can't play with three dangerous knives. No. When we get older, though, we may not be playing with knives or wanting to stay up till four in the morning, we usually fall asleep much earlier. But there's a different type of no. And that is certain things that I'm craving, certain things maybe that I'm addicted to, certain things that I really desire on some level. And to be able to hear the word no is extremely difficult. Sometimes from my mind, which gets involved in certain patterns, to be able to say to it no, to be able to challenge it is extremely difficult. No is the hardest word, not only in English, but in any language. And here is perhaps one of the secrets of this story. When you can hear the no, even if you disagree with the no, you are blessed. What often happens in life is the no is so difficult to hear, we hear it as a yes instead of a no. Chazal, who knew how to articulate profound truths in one sentence, have an expression about Bilam. The road that you want to travel down, you will, you will be led down that road. Bilam asked God what to do. God said, no. 
That should have sufficed. No means no. The second night, suddenly, God tells him yes. It was more about what he heard than what God told him. He was so eager to go that the no becomes manipulated into a yes. And this is the story of many a life. It is so hard to hear the word no. It is so difficult to hear the word no. We camouflage the no with secondary emotions and secondary statements to cover it up. I don't, I'm not always ready to hear the truth of what is going on, so I replace it with other messages. And sometimes the other messages are the exact opposite. We rationalize, we camouflage, we cover up, we justify. We put things in a particular context, we dismiss them for our comfort and protection, and therefore the no suddenly is transformed into a yes, or as the Chazal put it, the road you want to take is the road you're going to end up taking. God will not interfere always in the processes of people making choices because free choice is the most sacred value of humanity. Free choice captures the essence and purpose of creation. To eliminate free choice is to give up on humanity. To say, I wish you were, you were a rhinoceros. I wish you were a pre-programmed rat. I wish you were a pre-programmed cat. I wish you were a pre-programmed computer. Free choice is the infinite vote of confidence that God has in the human soul and the human spirit to be able to extricate its toxicity from itself and follow, follow its true values. But till we get to that point, we make mistakes. One of the greatest mistakes we make is we hear what we want to hear. In Yiddish there's an expression, Menschen Herren was a villain Herren, which is a little translation of people hear what they want to hear. I could tell you from my personal experience, I'm a teacher, as some of you know, and I speak, and unfortunately I sometimes speak a lot, as some of you are well familiar with. And I hear a lot of feedback of the things I say. People email me what I said. People come to me and ask me questions or challenge or whatever what I said. And when I'll often tell the person, I never said that, or at least I, don't, I can't say that I don't remember saying that, but I usually remember what I say at least for a few minutes. They know, of course, I heard this. And to tell somebody, you heard what you wanted to hear. You heard what you're comfortable hearing. We sit and we hear, but we have prearranged patterns in our brain. They're called neural pathways, neurological pathways that are trained, that are developed. And we hear messages that we're comfortable with, that affirm our previous patterns. And sometimes we hear those messages from ourselves, not only from other people. And when I want to hear something, that's what I'm going to hear, even though it has nothing to do with truth, because that's what I'm capable of hearing. And if that's the only thing I'm capable of hearing, that's the only thing I'm going to hear. You could put it this week, there was once I, <laughs> this is a marketing strategy, one of the presidents had an advisor, and he was very into cats. He wrote a book about cats, taking care of cats, nurturing cats. And once they interviewed him on, um, on television, about his tenure with the president, the particular president of the United States, that he was advisor. But the book just came out. So he had one agenda. The agenda was to sell the book about cats. So they tell him, so tell us about your experience with President Ford. He said, oh, he loved cats. <laughs> what, about, what about with President Johnson? Oh, he really didn't like cats. What about Carter? He started to speak about his wife's feelings about cats. The entire presidency of the United States of America was reduced to one facet, and that is the relationship of the presidents of the U.S. to cats. And this was premeditated and intentional. It wasn't subconscious. He needed to sell his book on cats. But we do this all the time subconsciously. 
the agendas I need to confirm, I will uh, confirm and affirm. The fears I need to validate, the anger I need to justify, I will continue to justify by hearing what I have to hear. How often does one spouse say something to another spouse? What they said and what the other person heard are not planets apart, they're universes apart. Planets apart is nishtas like you can get there with a spaceship. Universes apart, there's no way of getting there. What I tell you, or what this person tells me, and what I heard them say, is not only sometimes different, it's sometimes the exact opposite. Because I can only hear things with the tools that I have. Sometimes a person is not ready for certain messages. They're just not. You could say the whole truth, but they just can't hear any of it, and then you become their enemy. Because you become threatening. Or they just completely manipulate it. And sometimes it's conscious, sometimes it's unconscious. Chazal put it all, all into that one sentence in Gemara. Ultimately, you have to choose your own path. God said no. He said no. Bilam heard it. The second night, Bilam suddenly heard, yes, God got very upset. God got very, very upset. And the angel obstructs the donkey. He doesn't want Bilam to go. And finally, Bilam realizes that he says, oh, so you really don't want, you don't want me to go. No kidding, genius. I told you the first night, no. And then he says, okay, so I'm going to go back. He says, no, now I want you to go. <laughs> he says, okay, we're going. And yet, we see another pattern to the story. And that is, despite Bilaam hearing what he wants to hear and manipulating the message, God doesn't detach. He doesn't disengage from Bilaam. He doesn't say, okay, I said it once. You want to destroy yourself? Destroy yourself. No, no, he will continue to get involved. Bilaam heard a yes, and then the angel stopped him. Bilaam said, you don't want me to go? I'll go back. And then Hashem says, now I want you to go. This is your choice. This is your decision. But we're going to figure out how to transform your curses into your blessings. Which now brings us to step two. Namely, what happens in this process? A donkey opens up its mouth. There are quite many miracles in the Tanakh, but this is certainly a funny one, a humorous one, and a unique one. But the biggest question is, who needed it? What was the point of it? I mean, a donkey opening its mouth and having a conversation with a human being, especially a Russian Marusha like Bilam, who was no tzatzka, was no saint, was no righteous man, you could see from the story, he's eager to curse the Jewish people. They're not personal enemies of it. They didn't do anything to him. But the donkey opens his mouth for what purpose? A miracle, there's an expression in Chazal, Nature is sacred. Nature is not a mistake. Nature is not random. Nature are the sacred, divine patterns that govern the universe. Both the macrocosm and the microcosm. The universe at large and every individual person, every individual organism. The laws of nature are divine laws. When you study the laws of nature, you get an insight into a divine mind that created the rhythms, the patterns, the symphony of nature. Nature is exactly that, a symphony. And every creature plays its instrument in the cosmic divine symphony of life. You got that? Go out to a tree today, meditate, and take a look at the patterns. If you're familiar with how a tree functions, the tree is fulfilling its mission. It's playing its notes in the divine symphony. Teva nature is not a random or bad thing. It's sacred. That's why 
Miracles don't happen in vain. When they do happen, they're for a very specific purpose. What was the purpose of this astronomical nace, miracle, of a donkey opening its mouth? So you'll say, well, God didn't want Bilaam to go. <laughs> if God didn't want Bilaam to go, he could have shown the angel to Bilaam initially like he showed it to the donkey. What happens in the story? The donkey is going. Bilaam is riding on the donkey. The donkey sees Hashem's angel obstructing its path. And then there are the three acts where the donkey doesn't continue to move and Bilaam beats it. So the donkey speaks and says, why did you beat me? So Bilaam explains, because you embarrassed me and disgraced me. I should have killed you. And then the donkey says, come on, you know me better. I'm a good donkey. And then what happens? Hashem opens the eyes of Bilaam and he sees the angel. And Bilaam, excuse me, Bilaam bows his head. And Bilaam says, I'm sorry, I didn't know you're here. I didn't realize what is happening. I thought the donkey is just being disrespectful and lazy. So I got upset. Granted, Hashem wants to obstruct Bilaam's path. He wants to make Bilaam realize that this journey is unacceptable. It's immoral. It's evil. Granted. So first of all, you could tell Bilaam again not to go. You want to do it in this way while he's going already? You're anyway going to show him the angel at the end. So show it to him. Instead of the donkey seeing the angel, let Bilaam see the angel. Let them both see the angel. Let the donkey see the angel and crouch. And Bilaam will see exactly why the donkey is crouching. And they can have the conversation at the end. It's not like the donkey spoke to Bilaam and told him everything. The donkey never told Bilaam what was happening. The donkey just said, why did you beat me? And then Hashem allowed Bilaam to see the angel. So just show Bilaam the angel initially. The miracle apparently would be much smaller. Why the need for this astronomical change of nature of a donkey opening its mouth and communicating with its master? For what purpose? Furthermore, when the donkey says, you beat me three times, Rashi says that what the donkey meant was, you want me to uproot a nation that celebrates Shalash Regalim, three holidays. In other words, we are focusing and paying attention even to one expression of the donkey. The donkey said Shalash Regalim three times, also intimating the three Regalim, the three holidays of Pesach and Shavuos and Sukkot. That's how much focus we're putting even on a detail. Rashi brings from the Medrash, why did the story happen three times? Why were the three acts? The donkey could have just crouched in one place. The angel stands there. And the whole story could have happened. Why three? Why three times? And the answer is, Simone Avois Hero. The angel was showing the donkey the signs of Avraham and Yitzchak and Yaakov. Each episode somehow corresponded to one of the patriarchs. Now you have to understand what that means. But what do we see from this? that the details, the nuances, how many times, all have a premeditated spiritual purpose. And yet, the whole story doesn't seem to have a purpose. The details of the story, Rashi tells us exactly why it happened. But when you'll ask Rashi, why did the whole thing have to happen that the donkey should speak? You're telling me why the donkey had to stop three times, connected to three of us. But I'm asking you a much bigger question. Why did the donkey have to open its mouth? What was gained? That it doesn't seem to be an answer. And it's even more than this because in Pirkei Yavis it says, the fifth period, the fifth chapter of the Ethics of the Fathers, Asar Advarim Nivru Be'erev Shabbos Ben Hashmashes. Ten things were created. Friday, Ben Hashmashes. You know Ben Hashmashes is Ben Hashmashes. They translate as dusk. It's basically twilight zone at the moments that are not day and not night. Basically from sunset to nightfall. Let's say sunset is... Uh, these days, 8.30, 8.30 p.m., it's not dark yet. The, sun, the ball of the sun has set. And then there will be nightfall when the light is gone as well. That, that period of time between sunset and nightfall, known in halacha between Shkia Sachama and Seisach when the stars emerge conspicuously, that is called Bein Hashmashas. It's twilight zone. It's Loyoyim Veloy Laila. It's not Mamish Day because... It's getting dark, but it's not mamish night because it's not dark yet. As they say, it's not dark yet, but it's getting there. <laughs> so that's the period called Ben Hashmoshes. 
there's a lot of debates exactly when exactly that is, various, uh, various opinions, but suffice it to say, it's a unique period of the day, and it says 10 things were created at that period, which is very unique why that period was chosen, like almost Shabbos, but not Shabbos, but not weekday, like Bein HaShmoshes. And one of the two things that were created, two things that were created were Piha Asoin, the mouth of the donkey, and Piha Aretz, and the mouth of the earth that opened to swallow up Kairach in the previous parsha of Kairach. Both were created Erev Shabbos Ben Ashmoshes. That means they were both inherent in the origin of creation, but not just in the six days of the week, in that special moment between the weekday and Shabbos, as the Maharal says, because all of the ten things created then represented things that are on the border between the physical and the spiritual, between the, between the Ruchni and the Gashmi, between the nature and the supernatural. A unique time. It's not Shabbos yet, but it's also not weekday. The mouth that swallowed up Kairach, the mouth of the earth, and the mouth of the donkey. The Mishnah brings another opinion, the ram of Avram Avinu, uh, the luchas, etc. Why was the mouth of the earth open to swallow up Kairach? So in Parshas Kairach, Moshe explains, Kairach, you're challenging my integrity. You're saying that I invented the entire distribution of vocations among me and my brother and my nephews and my cousins. You're saying that I lied in the name of God. If you're right, if you're right, you're right. If I am right, Briya Yivra Hashem, let God create a new phenomenon. Something we have never seen before. Let the earth open its mouth to authenticate that my mission is not about nepotism. It's about truth. It's about emes. So Moshe clearly articulates the purpose of that extraordinary miracle. When it comes to the second miracle, its neighbor that was created right then, the mouth of the donkey, explain it. Why don't you explain? Why? Who needed it? What would have happened if the donkey would have never spoken? Would your blintzes taste different? Would anything be different? The donkey did not speak. Bilam went on the donkey. The donkey saw the angel. The donkey crouched. Bilam started to beat it. And suddenly Bilam saw the angel and said, Oh my God. The angel said, Why are you, why are you doing this? And Bilam said, Because I didn't realize. Now I see you. Should I go back? And he says, Don't go back. Say Misa. Or it could have happened another 100 or 200, 300 ways. There are those, the Rambam holds, that the story of the donkey is not a literal story. It was a vision. Meaning, Bilam saw this in a vision. He heard the donkey speak in a vision. That's the view of the Rambam. And other is showing him there. al a few commentators who believe that there's no need, they felt there was no need to interpret this story literally, but only uh, metaphorically. It was a vision of the story, which the Rambam holds about a few different events. For example, the story of the snake enticing Chava to eat from the tree, according to the Rambam, was something that happened in Chava's mind and in Adam's mind. That's the view of the Rambam. Rashi and most com many commentators disagree. They prove from different sources that it was literal. Well, if it was a vision, then it wasn't a miracle. It was a type of vision. It's a type of experience, spiritual experience or mental experience. If it was literal, as Rashi interprets it clearly from this story, and many other Mepharshim, probably most Mepharshim, the question is, what was the point of it? And here, we come to observe something very profound, simple and profound. And that is, when the Torah introduces the angel the first time, the angel that obstructed the path of the donkey, the words are, Vayicharaf Hashem alekim ki hoylechu, Hashem was upset that he's going, Vayisyatsev malach Hashem baderech l'satan loy. The malach of Yutke Vavke, the malach of Hashem stood in the path to be an obstruction, to obstruct the path of the donkey. 
Sorry. So Rashi says, Malach Hashem, it says, Vayichar af Eloikim, Eloikim got upset, and Malach Hashem, Malach Yutke Vovke, the name of God is changed. Eloikim is strictness, upset, could be upset. Yutke Vovke is compassion. So Rashi says, Malach Hashem from the Chazal, the angel of God, obstructed is Malach Yutke Vovke, it was a Malach Shalrachamim. It was an angel of compassion. What made the angel an angel of compassion? It was the angel that wanted to have compassion on Bilam. It was expression of the divine compassion on Bilam that he should not continue on a path that is disastrous for the Jewish people, but most importantly, disastrous for himself, which was the original reason Hashem told him no. But then he heard yes, and then the Malach comes to take him back. Of course, at the end, he ends up going. But this Malach is a Malach of compassion. The Malach doesn't want Bilam to go. He wants to stop Bilam. He wants to help Bilam not go. But here's the deal. Bilam, as we can already learn, as we have already learned, is adamant to go. He is crazy about his anti-Semitism. His hatred to the Jewish people, as Rashi says, was stronger than Bullock's hatred. Bullock was afraid for his own maluch, his own empire. Bilam really deeply hated the Jewish people. He despised them. He loathed them. Somehow there was a very deep animosity he had. It says he hated them more than Bullock, who rented him and was ready to pay him all this money in order to curse them. So you're talking about a person who really wanted to hear yes because this mission spoke to him in a very profound way, which as we explained, what you want to hear, you're going to hear by hook or by crook. I could tell you no a hundred times and all you heard was yes. Got it. How can he be stopped? How can he be stopped? And this is what gives us insight into the story when we realize this. When Bilam gets on his donkey to go, the first thing that happens is the donkey is obstructed by the angel. So Bilam now sees that the donkey is not going. One person might have said, hmm, maybe there's a message here. Maybe my donkey knows more than I know. Maybe my donkey is allergic to something. Let me review what I want to do. Not as a uh, nachash, as some magical sign, but rather as an opportunity to reflect on what's happening. You get stuck somewhere. What's the point? What's the good God's message here? But of course, Bilam only sees this as an invitation to beat his donkey. So he beats his donkey. What happens in step two? It happens again. The donkey doesn't move. And again, three times. You would think maybe after two times, after three times, Bilam would get the message. Maybe God told you not to go. You're getting stuck here. You're getting stuck there. You're getting stuck there. Maybe there's a message. No. He beats the donkey three times. Bilam wants to go. When you want to go, you want to go. Obstructions are not seen as messages. They're seen as hurdles that you have to get over. You got to beat the donkey. You beat the donkey. You got to do what you got to do. You would think at this point God says, listen, you're an addict. You're completely, completely addicted to your thing. I will not mix in anymore. You will destroy yourself. Because this is what happens. When somebody has a single-minded perspective, they will go and go and go. No is an impossible word to hear. Every no is a yes. And every obstacle, they will simply pass over because they're not capable of anything else. In order to spear Bilam's own destruction, God was ready to change Sidre Bereshis. He was ready to change the systems of the world in the most powerful way so that Bilam should be able to wake up. And how do you wake up a man like Bilam? How do you wake up a man like Bilam? The donkey speaks. God's voice you can't hear anymore. 
Your own soul's voice you can't hear anymore. But the donkey you can hear. And the donkey looks at him and says, why are you torturing me? Why are you beating me? And Bilaam says, what do you mean? Because you're abusing me. <laughs> That's his answer. He's not like, oh my God. You remember when the fish spoke then? <laughs> Bilaam, imagine the fish say, stop that. Well, that guy also, I think, chopped off the head. No, he got terrified. He was terrified. I mean, so the story went. I wasn't there. But Bilaam says, what do you mean? You're disgracing me. So the donkey says, what do you mean? You've known me your whole life. I'm a good guy. I'm a good donkey. I've been loyal to you. That's what the donkey says. So Garnish Gehofen, the donkey spoke. Bilaam, the donkey spoke for heaven's sake. The world has changed. Why? Why? Because it crouched. Why did it crouch? Because you're not supposed to go. You need a bigger message? But that's where Bilaam's head was. You hear what you want to hear by hook or by crook. If you're psychologically not ready, if you're emotionally not ready for the truth, donkeys can speak, mountains could move, angels can appear, the world can be transformed, but you're going to go for the next addiction. You will still follow that path, whatever that path is. I'm not only talking about addiction. I'm talking about all types of behaviors and patterns that are alien to your own deepest truth. And God, at this point, still doesn't give up. He now does, in a way, what is even greater. He allows the angel to communicate to Bilam. But when is it? It's the middle of the day. Bilaam was only traveling by day. There was no traveling at night at the time. Before Thomas Edison, night was night. No night life. Night you went to sleep. Unless you were learning by the moon or you had a candle for a few hours. Night was night. There was no night life. Imagine for teenagers. They went to sleep at night. The sun set and God said, Schluffy time. And nobody can argue. It was dark. Then came Mr. Edison and gave us our beautiful nightlife. And, uh, and history moves on. And we got to deal with the realities of celebrating night. <laughs> In places like here, or Brooklyn, a lot of people wake up at night. Daytime is a time to sleep and relax. And night is when so many people come to life. But it's not nature. If you want to live with the heartbeat, the rhythm of nature, David HaMelech says, A'ira shachar. I wake up dawn. Dawn doesn't wake me up. When dawn comes, I'm already here. I welcome the day. I welcome dawn break. Those of you who have ever watched a dawn break, you know exactly what it means to welcome dawn break. He says this in Tehillim. A'ira shachar. The Shulchan Aruch brings it in the first section. Simon Aleph. Ani ma'erir ha-shachar ve'en ha-shachar ma'erir oisi. I awake dawn, and dawn does not awake me. You have to know if you're in the position of living that way, but it's really um, being in tune with nature. So there was no traveling at night. Bilaam was there by day. We learned before, as I said, that all visions of Bilaam could only happen at night when he was asleep. Why? Because during daytime, in his full consciousness, he wasn't capable of hearing the voice of God. At night, in a dream, in a trance, he can hear the voice of God. And God changed that too. Now he can see the angel in the middle of the day as he's traveling and the angel is communicating with him. This was the third step of changing nature. And you would think by now, Bilaam would be a transformed person. Bilaam is shaken up. Bilaam says, we're going back. We're going back. And the Malach says, no, this time we're going. This is where you are, this is where we're going, but we're going to transform it. We're going to transform your, cor curse, your curses into blessings, which means in a person's life, we hear no, we're told no, but we hear yes, we're told no, and we hear yes, we're told no, and we hear yes, and God says, this is your path, but I'm not going to leave you. I will come back and come back, and come back. I will hold your hand a little bit, even if I will not force you. And even when you will end up 
taking every no and turning it into a yes. If we hold on together, ultimately we're going to transform the curses into blessings. Even though there could have been a different path where you would have chosen no initially, but this is how you chose, this is the path, we're going to work it through this path. But human choice will never, ever be eliminated because it's the greatest vote of confidence that God has in people. And to take away free choice is basically saying people were a huge mistake. <laughs> this was a mistake. And he will not do that. He will not do that. The one thing you don't tell your child is you were a mistake. Giving birth to you was a mistake. You will have sleepless nights. You'll go to 193 therapists. You will find everything in the world to do and not to do. You will make hundreds of mistakes. But you will not tell your child you were a mistake. At least if you're functional and healthy. Why? Because God will never say free choice was a mistake. Free choice, a mistake, means you were a mistake. I should have made a machine. If I would have made a machine, I would have had nachas. But that means I would have had nachas from a machine. There's no you, and I trust you. But it goes even deeper than this. It's Friday afternoon of creation. The whole world was created. The whole world. It's almost Shabbos. It's already sunset of Friday. The world is complete. We have, we have, of course, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, which means we have all of the oceans and waters, the entire ecosystem. We have all the galaxies and planets. We have the whole world of botany. We have the world of mammals and fish and birds. And finally, we have human beings. We have the entire planet of Earth and the entire cosmos, the entire universe. And we're about to go into Shabbos, God inhaling, Kivoy Shabbos Mikol Melachtoi, Vayoy Mashvi Shabbos Vayinofash, the day of rest. Ba Shabbos, Ba Menucha Shabbos comes and rest comes. And it's Erev Shabbos. And God says, wait, there's one more thing I have to create. They say, what? He says, the mouth of the donkey. What's missing in the world? And he says, in 2,488 years, exactly. Matan Torah was 2448. This was 40 years later. So it's 2488, right? 2448, 2488. In two and a half thousand years, or exactly 2,488 years, there's going to be a Gentile, Billa, not a Jew, and an anti-Semite, and not Stam, a vile one who hates Jews more than Balak. A great person, great potential, great spirit, uh, certainly great talents. Chazal say that he was as great as Moshe in his spiritual gifts, in his gifts of prophecy. So you could understand a little bit about Bilaam's potential. But nonetheless, great people can also fall very, very low, and he's going, to he's going to be around. And he's going to be determined to curse the Jewish people. So now, right before Shabbos comes in, the world is not going to be complete until I create a special mouth for his donkey to be able to open its mouth and shake him out of his slumber, shake him out of his addiction, shake him out of his apathy, shake him out of his toxicity, shake him out of his promiscuity, and allow him to wake up and smell the coffee and ask himself, maybe I have made a deep and profound error. Maybe it's time to recalculate as Waze does or GPS does my entire voyage, my entire journey. And the whole world, two and a half thousand years earlier, would not be complete until this mouth of the donkey was created for one purpose. Who needed it? For God to demonstrate how much I care for an individual. And this is not a Jew. This is a non-Jew. And a non-Jew had a horrible reputation. But I want to help him return. I want to help him do tshuva. I want to help him not go down a path of destruction and, and, uh, and, uh, and hatred. I want him to be able to return. And for this one man, nobody else is going to use this donkey again. 
at least maybe the donkey will be used. It's okay, it's a separate Indian. What happened with this donkey? Did the donkey die? Is the donkey it's a separate Indian? But certainly this mice didn't happen before, didn't happen after. To be sure, there are sometimes donkeys that speak. Perhaps, but not this language, not this story. But I'm going to do this. Why? So that Bilam might, might be able to come back. I cannot take away his choice. He will make his choice. But through his choices, I will be present with constant reminders and opportunities to be able to get off your high horse or your high donkey, to be able to climb down the fence, and to be able to come back to sanity, to be able to come back to normalcy. At kedekach. What do we learn from this? We learn from this one powerful insight. If this is true about Bilam, how much more so must this be true about a Jewish child, about any person, Jew or non-Jew, but certainly God's people, God's children, we make choices in life. A lot of those choices that we make are not choices in the sense that they are not free, because we make choices with the tools that we have. Sometimes we're told no. There's a voice inside that says no. You could do better. But I can't hear no. So I take the no and I turn it into a yes. You probably meant yes. Yes for a week. Yes for a month. Yes for a year. I can always change. We can always do it this way. And the yes and no are not always conscious. They're subconscious sometimes, which is even harder to hear. Who hears a no but subconscious? In the subconscious, you take the no, you turn it into a yes. But your soul knows the truth. And therefore, tomorrow night, you heard yes, but the next day, you hear again, no. But of course, you have to now deny that no. And this time, you have to deny the no with much more ferociousness. Because now that the no has emerged after the yes, you must suppress it with far more strength and dynamite charisma and brilliance in order for it not to swim up again. An alcoholic once told me, he says, we alcoholics drink to drown our sorrow. Little did we realize that sorrow floats. So as the no emerges back to the top, you really have to punch it down into the depths of the water to be able to make sure it doesn't come back. So you will beat that donkey once and twice and three times. You will threaten to kill it. The donkey will speak to you. And you think you would be woken up, but if you are invested in your story, in your trauma, in your patterns, in your addictions, no, no is enough to hear. Whoops. No, no. No, no. No, no is powerful enough to be able to get you. The angel speaks to you. The soul speaks to you, but I am still adamant. And nonetheless, God will be there. Throughout this entire journey of yourself or your loved ones, God will be there. He'll be there constantly. He is the one who set up the angel. He is the one who set up the donkey. He is the one who allowed the donkey to hear, he, to see. He's allowed the donkey to speak. He is the one who allowed Bilam to see the angel. And at the end, Bilam wakes up and says, so we're going back. God says, now you have a different path. There's no going back. You have been down this path. Now is the art of transformation. Now you're going to have to take your trauma, your pain, your addictions, your lies, your dysfunction, your void, and transform it into blessings. And from this, the greatest poetry and prose will be written for the Jewish people, including the only verses that we have in Chumash. Not the only, but the most explicit and elaborate verses about the Geula about Mashiach, because all redemption is ultimately the transformation of goyla into geula, exile into redemption. The difference between goyla and geula is one letter. Goyla is gimel vav lamed hey. Geula is gimel alev vav lamed hey. What's the difference between exile and redemption? It's exactly the same thing. There's just an aleph inside. Aleph is the consciousness of the divine, the ability to be able to look at any situation and see it from an Aleph perspective. And then the very reality becomes transformed. Not by changing the circumstances or the facts. Every story can be re-experienced from a different angle. Every crisis 
is transformed into an opportunity. Every downfall into a catalyst and springboard for renewal and rejuvenation. Every abyss into a gaze into infinity. And every single mistake into a complete new discovery of the depths of human potential and the depths of human choice. Every disruption of normal activity or disassociation of normal life becomes a new level of appreciation in the gifts of life, the gifts of communication, and the gifts of relationship. God is teaching us a lesson. For a man like Bilam, I prepared two and a half thousand years earlier a mouth of a donkey to be able to walk with him in his abyss and help him come back. Are you going to tell me that there is any Jew that is not worth spending time, energy, resources in order to be able to go down into his or her challenges and pitfalls and sublimate them? Sometimes a person says, I tried once, I tried twice, I tried three times. Forget it! Write them off, throw them out of your house, throw them out of the community, give up on them. They want to destroy their life, let them destroy their life. Look how God behaves with Bilaam. And trust me, your child ain't no Bilaam. He never wants to curse the Jewish people. He doesn't want to see the Jewish people dead. He ain't no Bilaam. The Yiddish akin. Look at him. I told you no. <laughs> so you hear yes. I told you no. You hear yes. I send you a donkey once, twice, three times. An angel. Nothing. I'm not going to stop. I'm going to go there. And I'm going to prepare this two and a half thousand years in advance. When Shabbos is about to come and I go, wait, 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 wait. Got to think about Bilam. Who wants to think about Bilam? I rush him, Arusha, Soini, Israel. At the end, he didn't do tshuva. He didn't even do tshuva, the guy. He went. It, the blessings came out, but he, he himself never did tshuva. Nonetheless, this was God's plan for him. So when it comes to another person, a loved one, a student, a child, or not even a child or a loved one, not even somebody you know, but when you're dealing with a soul, any soul, never mind a Yiddish and a Shema upon which God says, one ought to never, ever, ever say, you made such horrible choices. I detach from you. The choices may have been destructive. You may be very critical of those choices. Unconditional love doesn't mean uncritical love. But it does mean I will not sever the cords. I will not run away to China emotionally. I will not expel you and I will not sever the relationship between you and me forever. I will be there. And I know that one day the curses will be transformed into blessings but only if I'm there and I'm ready to shake the world, including make donkey speak to the best of our ability of making donkey speak. I don't think we can do it as efficiently as God. But uh, no amount of energy or time or mental space or resources should ever be spared of bringing a soul back to its true core, to its true essence, to its Father in Heaven. If this is what God did for Bilam. Harasha, it sets a, a template, a paradigm of what our relationship should be. If you would ask most parents, what is the greatest joy that somebody can do for you? Right? Probably most parents will tell you if they have a son or a daughter who has been geographically lost or emotionally lost or spiritually lost and somebody goes and takes this boy and daughter and brings back this child to the parents, physically or emotionally, practically or spiritually, there's probably few joys that could compare to the delight and the gratitude and the eternal debt that the parents will feel to this person. Even though there's many things you can do for people, but probably this is the single greatest thing you can do for a healthy, functional, loving father or mother. If this is true with human parents, think how much true this is with Hashem, with our Father and Mother in Heaven. All the great things you can do in life, there's nothing that comes close to reaching out and touching the heart of a child of God and bringing that child back to himself or back to herself 
and back to their father and mother in heaven. This is the greatest joy. So profound that two and a half thousand years before it happened, right before Shabbos comes in, God says, we can't start Shabbos if we don't create the mouth of a donkey to be able to teach for eternity a lesson that I will make the donkey speak just to reach out even to a human being and help him find his path back to his true soul. Have a wonderful week. This class is brought to you by the yeshiva.net. Please help us continue the classes. Make even a small contribution at www.theyeshiva.net slash donate.